My brother received $150,000 from our aunt to start his business because he was her golden child. While she offered me only $10,000, so I decided to CT and then, Hi, I'm Ethan 27, M. I'm not usually one to get too hung up on family politics. I've always been more of the keep the peace and don't rock the boat type, but sometimes, it's hard to ignore when things just feel blatantly unfair. My older brother Jake has always been the golden child of the family. He's that guy who has it all, athletic, confident, and smart enough to be everyone's favorite. I'm no slouch, but standing next to Jake, it's hard not to feel a little like an afterthought. Growing up, our family always subtly, or not so subtly, praised him. My parents would brag about his grades, his varsity medals, and later, his business degree from some prestigious university. Meanwhile, I was the nice guy with a dream of helping others, but in the kind of way that doesn't really make headlines or sound impressive at family gatherings. After graduating a year ago, I decided I wanted to build a non-profit to support underserved communities. I envisioned a space where people could access job resources, educational support, and even mental health services. My family often smiles politely when I talk about it, and I'm pretty sure they think it's cute or something. They seem to see it as one of those youthful dreams that will pass. And Aunt Sophia, the person in our family with the most influence and wealth, has never really taken me seriously. Aunt Sophia is a character. She's my mom's older sister, loaded with money and used to getting her way. She doesn't have kids of her own, so she's always been more than generous with Jake and me. At least, that's what I thought. But then last summer happened. I was on the couch, scrolling through emails from potential nonprofit partners when my mom mentioned that Jake had a meeting with Aunt Sophia. I didn't think too much of it at the time. They're always in touch, and I figured it was just another family catch-up. But then Jake called me later that night, practically bouncing through the phone with excitement. He had secured a $150,000 investment from Aunt Sophia to help him start his own business, a new restaurant, something he'd been talking about for a while. I felt my stomach tighten. 150 grand. I couldn't believe it. Aunt Sophia had always been good to us, sure, but this was on another level entirely. I tried to be happy for him. I mean, he's my brother, but the resentment gnawed at me. Here I was, struggling to get enough funding for a non-profit to help people, while Jake's restaurant dreams got the financial boost of a lifetime. And it's not that I don't want Jake to succeed, but I couldn't shake the feeling that Aunt Sophia's support wasn't just about helping Jake's career. It was another reminder of how little she believed in me. She'd seen me hustle and try to get my non-profit off the ground, yet it didn't seem to matter to her. Wasn't what I was doing important? Didn't it deserve her support too? I couldn't let this fester without at least saying something. A few days after hearing the news, I decided to pay Aunt Sophia a visit. I felt ridiculous rehearsing what I'd say to her in the car on the way over, but I needed to be prepared. The drive to her house took about 30 minutes, but it felt like I was in the car for hours. My mind ran in circles, debating how I'd approach the subject. I didn't want to sound jealous or resentful, but I knew I had to be honest. When I arrived, Aunt Sophia greeted me warmly, completely unaware of the storm of emotions I'd been carrying. Her house was pristine, filled with tasteful decor and art that probably cost more than I made in a year. We chatted casually for a bit, but as I took a deep breath to broach the real topic, I could already feel her eyes subtly judging me, the way they always seemed to when I mentioned anything idealistic. After a bit of small talk, I finally managed to bring it up. Aunt Sophia, I wanted to talk to you about something. You know, I've been working hard to get my non-profit going. I just, well, I wondered if you might be able to help me the way you're helping Jake. I felt my face grow warm as I spoke, but I held her gaze, hoping she'd understand. Her smile didn't fade exactly, but it did freeze a little. She leaned back in her chair, crossing her arms in a way that told me she was about to deliver one of her kindly worded lessons. Oh, Ethan, she said, voice dripping with practiced politeness. I think it's wonderful that you want to make a difference, but you have to understand, Jake is investing in something that has tangible returns. A restaurant is a real business, with real potential for growth and profit. I wanted to scream. So, the work I'm doing doesn't count as real? I said, trying to keep my voice steady. She chuckled, as if I'd made a cute joke. It's not that, dear. It's just different. 
Nonprofits are noble, of course, but they often struggle to stay afloat. They're not exactly. Well, they don't always provide the stability or recognition a business would. Her words felt like knives. I couldn't believe she was saying this. But Aunt Sophia, I'm helping people. I'm creating opportunities for those who don't have any. Isn't that worth something? She sighed, giving me a look that was equal parts pity and impatience. Of course it is. That's why I'm willing to offer you something. How about $10,000 to get you started? I think that's a fair contribution to your cause. I sat there, stunned. $10,000. Jake got $150,000, and I was offered a fraction of that, as though my dreams and hard work were nothing but a passing phase. She looked at me like she just offered me a great gift, but it only felt like another rejection, another reminder that I'd never be valued as highly as Jake in her eyes. Thank you, I managed to say, swallowing back the bitter response that was burning in my throat. I could feel my hands shaking as I stood up to leave. Aunt Sophia's expression softened, as if she'd done me a grand favor. Ethan, I hope you understand. It's not personal. I just believe in investments that grow. And who knows, maybe one day you'll get there too. I nodded, but I couldn't even look at her. The drive back was a blur. I kept replaying the conversation in my mind, each line adding fuel to the resentment already smoldering inside me. I felt so small, so dismissed. It wasn't even about the money itself. It was about what that money symbolized. Aunt Sophia believed Jake was capable of greatness, while I was just someone with lofty ideals that wouldn't amount to anything. By the time I got home, I was seething. This wasn't just about Aunt Sophia and her money. It was about years of being cast as the nice guy with little ambition, someone who wouldn't make it far without help. I'd had enough. I didn't know exactly what I was going to do, but one thing was for sure. Aunt Sophia's favoritism couldn't go unchallenged anymore. The days following my conversation with Aunt Sophia felt like walking around with a rock in my stomach. I couldn't shake the bitterness gnawing at me, replaying her words over and over in my mind. Real investment? tangible returns, and that patronizing little laugh whenever I tried to push back. I tried to brush it off, convincing myself I'd get over it. But the sting stayed, deepening every time I thought about Jake casually celebrating his restaurant dreams while I tried to scrape together enough support for the non-profit I believed in. After a week of sleepless nights, I couldn't ignore it any longer. I needed to get closure, or at least say everything I'd held back in our first conversation. This time, I decided to be more direct. If Aunt Sophia was going to dismiss my ambition so easily, I wanted her to at least look me in the eye as she did it. So, I texted her, asking if she could meet with me to discuss some personal concerns. She responded right away, suggesting a time the next afternoon, as if I were some business associate with a fleeting window in her schedule. I arrived at her place feeling a combination of frustration and apprehension. I had no idea how she'd react to what I wanted to say, but I was determined to keep my cool and lay it all out. She welcomed me in with that same warm, oh, Ethan, how are you? Expression she always used, completely unaware of the anger bubbling beneath my polite nod. I cut straight to the chase. Aunt Sophia, I need to talk to you about the way you handled our last conversation. I left feeling really dismissed, like my dreams and plans were, well, unimportant to you. I don't want to sound ungrateful, but it's hard not to notice the difference between what you're giving Jake and what you're offering me. She leaned back, sipping her tea calmly, and looked at me with a mix of surprise and slight amusement. Oh, Ethan, you're taking this all too personally. This isn't about you. It's about the reality of business. Jake has a solid plan for a profitable restaurant. That's the kind of venture where my help can make a real difference. But why doesn't my nonprofit deserve the same chance? I pushed, struggling to keep the edge out of my voice. I'm working hard to make a positive impact. Isn't that worth investing in? She sighed, setting her tea down. You're a bit too sensitive about all of this, Ethan. Nonprofits are well meaning, but they're not exactly stable investments. Besides, she added with a slight shrug, you'll figure out your own way if you're meant to. That's how the world works. Her words stung, not just because of the dismissal, but because they confirmed what I'd feared. She'd never take me or my work seriously. I felt a flush of anger and tried to hide it, 
swallowing back the urge to snap. Instead, I try to keep my voice steady. Maybe the world would be a better place if people like you gave nonprofits a fighting chance. She let out a little laugh, and it felt like the final twist of the knife. Oh, Ethan, there's no need to get worked up. One day, maybe you'll understand. But right now, you're letting your emotions get in the way of reason. The conversation ended soon after, with her essentially patting me on the head and showing me out the door like some petulant child. I drove home feeling utterly defeated. Her message was crystal clear. She didn't believe in me or the work I was doing, and she probably never would. I'd reached my limit. This wasn't just about Aunt Sophia's favoritism anymore. It was about every time my efforts had been trivialized in the family, every instance where Jake was put on a pedestal while I was encouraged to find my own path. If Aunt Sophia saw me as second to Jake, maybe that had been the family's view all along. The feeling was exhausting, yet somehow it lit a fire in me I hadn't felt before. That night, I found myself diving down a rabbit hole. I started with family stories I vaguely remembered, and then moved on to legal documents and family records I could access online. Aunt Sophia had a colorful past, to say the least. I knew she had always been the dominant figure in her siblings' lives, including my mom's, but I hadn't realized just how deep her involvement went. Piece by piece, I started uncovering a pattern. Aunt Sophia had always used her wealth as a lever, wielding it to maintain control and influence over family members. From supporting one cousin's business but refusing to help another's, to giving money with strings attached to ensure loyalty, her generosity always came with conditions. It was almost as if she thrived on knowing that people depended on her and on making it clear that she alone decided who succeeded and who didn't. The most shocking part was discovering that my mom, too, had been affected by Sophia's manipulation. I found old letters and family accounts describing how Aunt Sophia had bailed her out of a bad financial situation years ago, on the condition that she'd give up a potential promotion that would have made her independent from the family's help. It made me furious. My own mother had given up opportunities because of Aunt Sophia's influence, and here I was, staring down the same path. I couldn't let it go on. This favoritism wasn't just hurting me. It was shaping the entire family dynamic. Aunt Sophia's wealth had become a dividing line, creating a hierarchy in which she played puppet master, deciding who rose and who fell. And right now, I was at the bottom of that ladder, while Jake stood at the top, entirely unaware of the price of her so-called support. Over the next few days, I kept uncovering more. The stories were disturbingly similar, each one laying out a new instance of her strategic generosity. There were cousins who had fallen out of her favor, left struggling when she abruptly cut her support. A few more relatives had quietly drifted away from family gatherings altogether, likely after being dismissed as not worth it by Aunt Sophia. It was as though she had a family map, moving us around as she pleased, and anyone who dared step out of line was cast aside. I knew I had to confront her, and this time, it wouldn't be in private. It wouldn't be with polite words or a calm explanation. This was bigger than just me. I wanted the whole family to understand what Aunt Sophia's favoritism and control had done to us, how it had twisted our relationships and forced us into roles that none of us had chosen. I was done being the quiet one. I was done trying to keep the peace. A plan began to take shape in my mind. Our cousin Lily was getting married in a month, and every family member would be there. It was the perfect opportunity, a setting where everyone would be together and Aunt Sophia's influence would be at its most visible. For once, I'd have an audience for what I had to say, and I wouldn't let her dismiss me as too sensitive or too emotional. She'd have to listen, and so would everyone else. I started preparing for what I knew would be a showdown. I gathered all the family history I could, making notes of specific instances where Aunt Sophia had played favorites, where she had pulled strings behind the scenes. I wanted to be ready to call her out on everything, to lay it all bare so there was no hiding behind her wealth or her charitable smiles. This wasn't about asking for money or sympathy. It was about exposing a pattern that had gone on for far too long. In some ways, I felt liberated. For the first time, I wasn't concerned about upsetting Aunt Sophia or falling out of favor with her. I realized I didn't need her validation or approval. What mattered was that I stand up for myself and the others in the family who had been quietly sidelined over the years. 
and if it meant a full-blown confrontation that might change the family dynamic forever, so be it. I was ready. A brewing storm was gathering, and I had no intention of backing down. The closer we got to Lily's wedding, the heavier the tension felt, pressing on me every day. I was doing my best to keep calm, to focus on what I wanted to say without letting the resentment consume me. But the storm was already rolling in, and it wasn't about to let me off easy. Two weeks before the wedding, I decided I needed to talk to Jake. The bitterness had been building up too long, and I couldn't walk into that wedding without addressing it. I needed him to understand how much all of this had affected me, how Aunt Sophia's favoritism had cut deeper than he knew. Jake was lounging on his deck when I arrived, looking relaxed, drink in hand, like the whole world was just there to pat him on the back. I barely managed to keep my voice steady as I walked up, feeling the familiar irritation creeping in. We need to talk, I said, sitting down across from him. He raised an eyebrow, immediately sensing something was off. Sure, man. What's up? I took a deep breath, forcing myself to start calmly. Jake, have you thought about what Aunt Sophia's gift means for me? I mean, the way she's treating us so differently? He blinked, caught off guard, then shrugged. Look, Ethan, it's not like I asked her for that money. She offered it, and I accepted. It's not really about you. That's easy for you to say. I replied, my voice tight. You've been the favorite your whole life, Jake. Aunt Sophia's been throwing money and praise at you since you were a kid, and now it's like you're the only one with dreams that matter to her. Don't you see how that affects me? He rolled his eyes, clearly uncomfortable with the direction this was taking. Ethan, I get that you're feeling frustrated, but I didn't do anything wrong here. I didn't make her give me that money. And it's not fair to make this my problem. I could feel the anger bubbling up again, stronger this time. Jake, it's not about what you did. It's about the fact that you're benefiting from this favoritism, from this whole setup where you're the successful, ambitious one, and I'm just there. Doesn't it bother you that Aunt Sophia doesn't care about what I'm trying to do? Jake's expression shifted, a hint of annoyance crossing his face. You're being self-centered, Ethan. This isn't about who got more money, it's about family support. If you'd stop playing the victim, maybe you'd get somewhere on your own instead of blaming everyone else for your problems. His words hit me like a slap, but they also fueled the fire that had been smoldering inside. Playing the victim? I spat back, barely able to keep my voice steady. Do you know how many times I've been pushed aside, had to play second to you, just because you're exactly what Aunt Sophia and the family want? You're standing there reaping the rewards of favoritism, and you don't even realize how easy you've had it. Jake looked like he was about to argue back, but I was done holding anything back. Did you even know how Aunt Sophia has used her money over the years to manipulate everyone around her? I did some digging, Jake, and she's been playing favorites for as long as I can remember. And mom? She could have had a different career path, a promotion that would have changed her life, but Aunt Sophia convinced her to give it up so she'd stay dependent on the family. She's been doing this for years, and now she's pulling the same thing on us. Jake's jaw tightened as he absorbed my words, the shock flickering across his face as I laid out the details I'd uncovered. His confident demeanor faltered, and for a moment, I thought he might actually understand. Ethan, he started slowly, I, I didn't know any of that, but I still don't get why you're so intent on making this a battle. Maybe you're right about Aunt Sophia, but this isn't worth tearing the family apart. My fists clenched involuntarily. Easy for you to say when you're the one benefiting. You're standing there telling me to just let it go because you don't have to deal with the consequences of her bias. But I do. Every time I'm sidelined, every time my dreams are dismissed, I'm reminded that Aunt Sophia, and apparently everyone else, doesn't think what I do matters. Jake looked down, clearly thrown. But he didn't argue further. He just muttered, Look, Ethan, I get it. I really do. But maybe there's a better way to go about this. You can't just blow things up at a family wedding. That's going to hurt everyone. Not just Aunt Sophia. But I was past the point of caring about who got hurt. No, Jake. I'm done being quiet. Aunt Sophia's favoritism, her control. It's poisoned this family long enough. If I have to be the one to bring it out in the open, then so be it. I walked away from that conversation with a strange sense of relief. 
Jake hadn't given me the understanding or support I'd hoped for, but at least he knew where I stood. And if he didn't want to stand with me, that was his choice. I couldn't keep letting him or anyone else dictate what I felt or what I deserved. The following days, I put the final pieces of my plan together. I reviewed the stories, the information I'd gathered, making sure I could recall every detail if I needed to. Aunt Sophia was the kind of person who would never acknowledge her faults unless someone laid them out, unmistakably and irreversibly, in front of her. When the day of Lily's wedding finally arrived, I felt a nervous energy coursing through me. This was it. The moment I'd chosen to bring it all out into the open, with everyone gathered around. I knew that some people might see me as the bad guy, the one stirring up trouble at a family celebration, but I couldn't let the fear of judgment hold me back any longer. The ceremony was beautiful, as weddings tend to be, and the reception was grand. Aunt Sophia's way of showing her generosity and position in the family. The tables were adorned with flowers, the food was extravagant, and the guests looked like they'd stepped out of some glossy magazine. Everything was perfectly staged, the way Aunt Sophia liked it. But I was only half aware of all of it. My attention focused on the moment I'd been planning for weeks. I waited until most of the family had gathered near the head table to give their toasts and speeches, the kind of tradition that made Aunt Sophia look like a benevolent family matriarch. Jake caught my eye from across the room, his expression tense, almost like he was silently begging me to reconsider. But I wasn't backing down. When it was my turn to speak, I took the microphone, steadying myself as the room grew quiet. I saw Aunt Sophia's smile, that familiar expression of indulgent politeness she wore whenever I was around. But this time, I was done with politeness. I want to take a moment to acknowledge the people who have supported our family over the years, I began, my voice loud and clear. And I especially want to thank Aunt Sophia. She's been generous to many of us, but I think it's time we talk about what that generosity has cost us. There was a collective murmur, an awkward shifting among the guests, and Aunt Sophia's smile faded, replaced with a look of confusion. You see, Aunt Sophia has always chosen favorites. She's used her wealth and influence not just to help, but to control, I continued, my eyes locking on hers. For some of us, that meant opportunities withheld, dreams dismissed. And for others, it meant gaining things they never even had to ask for. This favoritism has divided us, turned us against each other, and I think it's time we acknowledge it. A few gasps rippled through the crowd, and I could see Jake burying his face in his hands, clearly wishing he could disappear. Aunt Sophia's expression turned from shock to a hardened glare, but I kept going, listing the instances I'd uncovered of her manipulations, her selective help that only benefited those who stayed in line with her expectations. When I finished, there was a dead silence. No one dared to move or speak. Aunt Sophia rose slowly from her seat, her face pale but her eyes filled with fury. She looked at me with a chilling calmness. Ethan, how dare you ruin this beautiful occasion with your childish grievances? You have no idea what I've done for this family. Oh, I think I know exactly what you've done. I shot back, meeting her gaze. And I think everyone here does too. With that, I set the microphone down, the weight of my words hanging heavy in the air. I didn't stay to watch Aunt Sophia's reaction, nor did I seek out Jake's approval. I'd done what I came to do, and the truth was out. I left the reception hall, the cold night air hitting me as I stepped outside, feeling both drained and oddly liberated. For better or worse, the storm had finally broken. The silence that filled the reception hall after my confrontation with Aunt Sophia felt thick enough to slice through. I could feel every pair of eyes boring into me, some wide with shock, others narrowing in disapproval or confusion. Aunt Sophia stood there, stunned, her polished composure cracking for the first time in years. She finally found her voice, though it trembled with barely contained fury. Ethan, I don't know where you get the audacity to accuse me of such things, especially here of all places. I've done nothing but support this family. Every decision I've made has been for the benefit of everyone. Her words had the effect of reigniting the crowd, as murmurs rippled through the guests. Some of our cousins exchanged glances, as if re-evaluating every interaction they'd ever had with her. Others averted their eyes, clearly hoping this would all just blow over. 
But Aunt Sophia's words were still ringing in my ears, like a dare to go even further. What you call support, Aunt Sophia, was really about control. And it's time we stopped pretending it's anything else. You only help people when it suits you, when they're willing to play by your rules. And the minute anyone steps out of line, you cast them aside. Aunt Sophia's face hardened, and her voice grew cold. I'm sorry if you feel that way, Ethan. But let's be real. What you're doing, this nonprofit or whatever it is, isn't the same as running a business. It's nice, but it's not something to invest in. Not like Jake's restaurant. I don't see why that's so hard for you to understand. At her words, the murmur in the room shifted into something more heated. The way she dismissed me, my work, my dreams, was right there for everyone to see. Jake was sitting close to her, visibly uncomfortable but not saying a word. Aunt Sophia's words had stung him too, if only for the fact that her favoritism was now on full display. The cousins who had been silently absorbing everything looked from me to Aunt Sophia, realization and judgment flickering across their faces. Suddenly, I heard my cousin Mark, one of Aunt Sophia's former favorites before he'd fallen out of favor years ago, speak up. Ethan's not wrong. Aunt Sophia, you promised me help when I wanted to start my own business too, but as soon as I decided to do it my way, you pulled the funding. And you know what? I actually lost money because I trusted you to come through for me. Aunt Sophia's face flushed. Mark, that was a different situation entirely. You weren't ready and you were too stubborn to take advice from someone who knows better. That's exactly what I mean, Mark shot back. You only help people when they do everything your way. The minute we want to make our own choices, we're on our own. At that, voices began to rise all around us. Other family members, one by one, started sharing their own stories, their own grievances. A few uncles and aunts took Sophia's side, saying she'd been nothing but generous, that we shouldn't be airing family business like this. But more and more of the cousins spoke up, emboldened by the opportunity to finally speak their minds. In the middle of this chaotic storm, Jake finally stood up, his face pale, hands raised in a futile attempt to calm the crowd. Everyone, please, this is Lily's wedding. Let's not ruin her day over. Over family drama. We can deal with this later, can't we? But his attempt to calm things only fueled the fire. My aunt, one of Sophia's closest allies, seized on his words. Oh, you'd say that, wouldn't you, Jake? Easy for you to stand there when you're the one who's been getting all the support, when you're her golden child. The rest of us? We've been struggling because Sophia only cares about the people who feed her ego. Jake looked wounded, but also guilty, and I could see the resentment flashing in his eyes. That's not fair. I didn't ask for any of this. Aunt Sophia offered to help me, just like she offered all of you. It's not my fault if she didn't think your plans were, well, worthy of her support. The room grew deadly quiet. It was the worst thing he could have said, and I could see him immediately regretting it, realizing that he just confirmed everyone's suspicions. Aunt Sophia's expression turned almost defensive, her cool confidence crumbling as she tried to regain control of the narrative. It's not favoritism she said sharply. I support the family members who show potential, who are ready to make responsible choices. That's why I support Jake. That's why I didn't support. Ethan's non-profit. Her eyes flicked to me, her tone almost condescending, as if she were lecturing a child. I couldn't help but laugh bitterly. So you're admitting it then? That some of us just don't meet your standards for support? That we're not worth the same respect? Her lips pressed into a thin line. It's not about respect, Ethan. It's about reality. I invest in what has a future. That's all. I saw Lily, the bride, off to the side, her face pale and drawn. The poor girl had barely said two words since I'd started, and guilt hit me hard as I realized the position I'd put her in. But the family's murmuring grew louder. Waves of pent-up anger and frustration breaking through the polished exterior of this perfect family. For the first time, they were acknowledging the cracks, the unfairness, the festering resentment. Jake stepped forward again, trying to salvage something from the wreckage. Everyone, please, we're family. Can we just take a step back and figure this out later? We don't need to make this a public spectacle. But his words only irritated those who felt wronged. 
Another cousin, Sharon, who had rarely spoken up before, crossed her arms and glared at him. That's easy for you to say, Jake. You're on the winning team. You always have been. The room exploded with arguments, old grievances surfacing like ghosts that refused to be silenced. Aunt Sophia finally had enough and raised her voice above the din enough. This is absurd. I'm not going to stand here and listen to a bunch of spoiled children complain about what they didn't get. You should be grateful for what I've done for this family. I stared at her, feeling both satisfied and a little sick. The fallout was worse than I'd expected, with the wedding reception dissolving into something more akin to a family courtroom, accusations flying left and right. And despite the satisfaction of seeing Aunt Sophia finally exposed, I couldn't ignore the fact that I'd opened Pandora's box in the middle of Lily's wedding. Seeing the hurt and disbelief on Lily's face twisted the victory into something sour. But it was too late to turn back. Aunt Sophia stood abruptly, her face pale but rigid, and looked around the room. If this is how you all feel, then I have no reason to stay. If you want to disrespect everything I've done, then so be it. She turned on her heel and walked out, her departure leaving a chilling silence in her wake. Her allies, including a few of my aunts and uncles, followed her, muttering about ingratitude and the nerve of the younger generation. As she left, I felt a strange mix of emotions, triumph, anger, and a gnawing guilt. I'd finally gotten my point across, yes, but the damage was undeniable. The family was fractured, possibly beyond repair. The cousins who had voiced their grievances looked relieved, but there was also a tension that hung in the air, a sense that we'd crossed a line that couldn't be uncrossed. Jake approached me as the crowd began to disperse, his face a mixture of anger and hurt. Congratulations, Ethan, he said, his voice thick with bitterness. You finally got what you wanted. Are you happy now? I didn't know how to answer. My satisfaction at confronting Aunt Sophia was real, but the chaos it had caused was overwhelming. I glanced around at the fragments of what had been, only hours earlier, a joyful family celebration. No. I replied quietly. I didn't want all of this. I just wanted things to be fair. Jake shook his head, clearly unconvinced. Well, fairness has a price, and you just made the whole family pay it. He turned and walked away, joining the few relatives who had stayed behind to console Lily, who looked devastated. Watching them, a wave of regret hit me. I had wanted justice, had wanted to break free of the favoritism that had defined my entire life. But now I was left questioning whether I'd gone too far, whether I'd sacrificed more than I'd intended in the name of fairness. I stood alone as the last of the guests left the room, leaving me to reckon with the consequences of my actions. Aunt Sophia was gone, the family was fractured, and I was left wondering if I'd won anything at all. The days following the wedding felt surreal. Aunt Sophia cut ties with most of the family immediately, not responding to calls or messages from anyone, including Jake. She left a void in the family that no one knew how to fill, and everyone seemed to be blaming someone else for the fallout. My parents were disappointed, though they never said as much directly. My mom kept her distance, clearly heartbroken by the family's division, while my dad tried to keep the peace, hinting that maybe things could still be repaired. As for Jake and me, we were barely speaking. Our last conversation had been laced with bitterness, and I knew he blamed me for the mess. But a week after the wedding, he called, sounding unexpectedly subdued. We need to talk, Ethan. About all of it, he said. We met at a quiet cafe, both of us subdued. For the first time, we really talked. No anger, no accusations, just honest reflection. Jake confessed that Aunt Sophia's support had always made him feel conflicted, like he owed her a loyalty he never asked for. It hit me that maybe he'd been carrying his own weight of expectations all along, and my resentment had blinded me to his struggles. I didn't ask for any of this, Ethan. I always felt like I had to live up to her expectations, and I thought you didn't understand that. But now, maybe I was wrong, he admitted. Talking with him helped me realize that Aunt Sophia's favoritism wasn't just about me. It was a symptom of a much bigger family dynamic that had been quietly brewing for years. I hadn't started it, and I couldn't fix it alone. But maybe it was time to look beyond my own hurt. We agreed to try to mend what was left, for the family's sake, and for ours. In the following months, 
I worked on repairing my relationships with my parents and with Jake, though things with Aunt Sophia remained distant. Slowly, the family began to reconnect with cautious, hesitant steps toward understanding. It wasn't perfect, but I felt a sense of clarity about what mattered most. In confronting Aunt Sophia, I'd unleashed years of pent-up anger, but I'd also started a much-needed conversation. And while I might never be her favorite, I realized I didn't need to be. My path would be my own, free from expectations, and that, at least, felt like a step toward peace. If you like the story, subscribe right away and listen to new stories every day. Let us know what you like the most in the comments.